Hello and welcome to Dr. SAT Love, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Test, Suggestions on Prep Immediately Before Test Day. I'm recording this on Thursday evening, right before a Saturday SAT administration, so here are some last-minute tips. This is John Linneball from John Linneball Tutoring. You can reach me at johnlinneball.com, john at johnlinneball.com is my email, and you can call me at 415-986-7355, and my cell phone is 415-623-4251. These are some last-minute SAT tips. I've kind of tied them into the Dr. Strangelove theme. If you haven't seen this classic movie, you should, but you don't need to know the movie to understand these tips. So, first of all, this is for the last days before the SAT. Basically, we're just discussing last-minute prep and administrative details. So we're going to focus on some S words, studying, supplies, stress relief, strategy, and smart planning. First, studying. Make sure you know the formulas in the math section boxes at the beginning of each math section on the SAT. You can find it on any practice SAT that you've done or that you can find online. Stop studying at about 9 or 10 p.m. the night before. Look, you're not going to retain anything you study late at night before the test or on the test day, and not to mention you'll be tired and burnt out, so that doesn't help. Just stop at about 9 or 10 and then go to bed. Maybe you could check some formulas that you already know, but that's about it. Really, you don't want to do any heavy-duty studying. You're not going to learn anything particularly new after about 9 or 10 p.m. the night. Survival kit contents check. In them you will find 145 caliber automatic, two boxes of ammunition, four days concentrated emergency rations. One drug issue containing antibiotics, morphine, vitamin pills, pep pills, sleeping pills, tranquilizer pills, one miniature combination Russian phrase book and Bible, $100 in rubles, $100 in gold, nine packs of chewing gum, one issue of prophylactics, three lipsticks, Three pair of nylon stockings. Shoot, a fella could have a pretty good weekend in Vegas with all that stuff. So you won't need any of those supplies they've just listed, but you will need an approved calculator. You can find a list of approved and non-approved calculators for the SAT on the SAT's website, which is pretty easy to come by just by going to your web browser, like Google Chrome here, and just type in... SAT approved calculators. Here we go. All right, you can bring the TI-30, TI-34, TI-82, TI-83, da 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 da. So here's tech powered math. You can also our TI-84. Okay. Um, so there are many TIs. Da, da, da. Okay. So it looks like you can bring the TI-84. Anyway, there's a list of calculators for the SAT. You know, here's the SAT calculator policy. <clears throat> so this is collegereadiness.collegeboard.org forward slash SAT forward slash taking the test forward slash calculator policy. So you can see what an acceptable calculator is. Most graphing calculators, see chart. Okay, these brands all pass a test. Okay, can't bring a laptop, can't bring anything that can access the internet, anything that's a typewriter like keypad, pen input, or stylus, anything that uses electrical outlets, makes noise, or have a paper tape, calculator function on a mobile phone. Obviously, anything that's going to let you communicate with anybody outside the room is no good, and I guess electrical outlets keep, you know, paper tape that's just going to be a distraction and probably just a pain, so they don't want you to use that. All right, so bring extra batteries for your calculator since you already know you're not allowed to plug it into the wall. You know that the calculator will die on you during the test and no one will have any supplies for you. 
So what to bring and not to bring continued. Bring several sharpened pencils and a little plastic pencil sharpener. You should have several number two, you know, normal pencils that you use. Sometimes those are labeled HB if they're used for drafting, but it's the same thing. An HB is the same as a number two pencil, ready to go. A little plastic pencil sharpener is cheap and a nice investment, so you don't have to ask permission to sharpen your pencil, have a proctor do it, or whatever they'll do for you. Don't bring a pen. You can't do your essay with it. You can't do the multiple choice. You can't do the grid in. You can't do anything on the SAT with a pen. Again, not even the essay. So more what to bring and not to bring. Again, don't bring your smartphone. Leave it at home if you can. If you can't, they'll probably make you turn it off and put it in your bag or in your pocket. But you don't know that. They might make you leave it with them. And good luck getting reimbursed if they lose it or break it. In any event, in case your phone goes off while you know you thought you turned it off, etc., you don't want to be accused of cheating. So I would say, if you can at all, just leave the cell phone at home. Don't bring scrap paper. You won't be allowed to use it. They really should provide scrap paper at the SAT, but they don't. The only scrap paper you have is the test booklet itself and the little pl practice sheet on the answer thing for the essay. Anyway, don't bring scrap paper. Strategy. You want to eliminate obviously wrong answers and guess. Pick B or C for ones you don't know. Reading, you want to look for words in context. Chances are it's not the usual meaning of the word, so just go back to the line that they say, read around it a few lines. You should be able to figure it out. You want to use the command of evidence questions where they say, which of the following provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? You can use that to reverse engineer the previous question. If you don't know the answer to it, you can go and look at the command of evidence question answers and see which one of those actually gives you a clue as to what the first question's answer is. So math, you want to draw a diagram for geometry problems. If they just tell you a square with length, you know, side length three, uh, blah, 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 draw it. If a diagram is labeled not to scale, redraw it to scale the best you can. The nice thing about that is even though they're messing with you by drawing it not to scale, it means that the problem is easy if you draw the thing reasonably to scale, so you'll be able to figure it out by redrawing it. Math, you want to plug answers into equations starting with B or C. That's also called back solving. The answers are usually in order, like biggest to smallest or smallest to biggest. So let's say you have something like this problem. A is a positive integer. 3 times 3a plus 2 is equal to 42. And the answer choices are A, 2, B, 3, C, 4, D, 6. Use your calculator, figure it out, plug them in. If you do that, you'll see pretty quickly that, okay, 3a plus 2, if you put in 3, okay, that's going to be 9 plus 2, that's 33. Okay, that's not, you know, 9 plus 2 is 11, so that's not it. 4, okay, 3 times 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. 3 times 14 is 42. All right, don't do what I just did. Use the calculator so, um, so you don't make math mistakes or arithmetic errors after getting all the all the hard parts right, you know, you add wrong or something. Math, you want to add equations. Okay, if you have 7a plus 3b equals 20 and 3a plus 7b equals 40, what's the average of a and b? Add them together. Line them up like this. 7a plus 3a is 10a. 3a, 3b plus 7b is 10b. 20 plus 40 is 60. Okay, you can divide 10a plus 10b by 10 to get a plus b is 6, so the average is going to be a plus b over 2, so it's 6 divided by 2, which is 3. Again, use your calculator for arithmetic, avoid stupid errors, avoid stupid choices, that is a probability must be between zero and one, or zero to 100%, areas can't be negative, things like that. So if somebody says, you know, oh, the probability of that is like negative five, okay, no, it's not. That might be a nice metaphor, but <clears throat> it's not literally true. <clears throat> Strategy, you wanna avoid spas and scas. What's a spa? I don't mean a place where you go to get a nice massage or something. It's what I call wrong answers that appear correct just long enough for you to choose it impulsively and uh, move on before realizing you made a mistake. They're sucker punch answers. So you go, boom, you just got sucker punched. Um, so here we have Homer going, go! Oh! And here we have Dr. Strangelove who's fallen out of his wheelchair, but he's got his gun up in the air. So this is a sucker punch answer I fell for when I took the PSAT, the only time I took the PSAT. Don't worry, I still qualified for a National Merit Scholarship. But... 2 cubed. So of course the first sucker punch answer was A6. 
Did you pick A? Oops, you picked the spa. So did I. Answer A is a good location for a spa. You see it, pick it, then you move on. Then it's just don't when you get your test back. Strategy, running out of time. Are you running out of time in multiple choice? Just pick your favorite letter. Some test prep companies call it the letter of the day. I don't recommend choice A for the reason I just said, that it's a prime spa, sucker punch answer location. I generally recommend B or C on math problems since the highest and lowest answers are often wrong and usually their answer choice is A or D. So, if you're running out of time on the essay, just finish your body paragraphs, make sure your introduction matches them, and then just restate the intro as your conclusion, or if you're really short on time, just write something like, for the reasons above, the essay, the title of the essay they give you, convincingly uses ethos, pathos, and logos to support the author's point, which they tell you in the box at the end. So, just do that. If you can't even get that out, at least you'll have a solid thesis paragraph and evidence so the lack of a conclusion won't hurt you that badly. All right, English sucker punch answers, excessively detailed, overly focused answers to a non-detailed question. That is a passage about a person who obsessively hoards weapons and survival supplies in a bunker. The main idea is not the man really likes to collect weapons. It's the man is afraid of and preparing for a society destroying catastrophe that he will have to su survive. Answers to detailed questions using notable words in the wrong way. So if the passage says, Joseph loved all fruits except pomegranates, which he despised, they know the word pomegranate is going to stick out in your brain. So the sucker punch answer would be, which is true about Joseph's dietary choices, you know, the sucker punch answer would be, he loved to eat pomegranates. Because, you know, the part of your brain that's in a hurry is, look, it says pomegranate, it must be right, I remember reading pomegranate. Yeah, you have to read it, so... No, if he loved all fruits except pomegranates, and he loved to eat pomegranates is not the right answer. Another kind of answer you need to watch out for is the ska. Ska's are smart kid answers. These are answers that lower achieving students think the smart kids would choose, so they fall for them. So in English, this is a word like loquacious. So a question about a character who's very inarticulate, so he expressed himself through his musical talent might be characterized, or might be written something like, Tommy Trombone would most fairly be characterized as A, silly, B, verbally inarticulate, C, musically skilled, musically unskilled, I'm sorry, or loquacious. Loquacious means verbally skilled, eloquent, so he would not be loquacious, but a kid who maybe doesn't achieve so well in English might say, that sounds like a word that John Linnaball would use, so I pick it, so I'll be, I'll get the right answer too. Uh, they see you coming with that. So don't pick the word that you don't know unless you are absolutely certain that the other three choices are wrong. Then go ahead and pick it, but otherwise leave it alone. If a simple word that you understand will fit, that is the right answer, trust me. Okay, the math smart kid answer is cannot be determined from the information given. Do not choose this answer unless you know exactly what information you would need. So it would be the right answer for something like, if A plus B equals 1, 2, 3, what's the value of A? You'd have to know what B is, or you'd have to have another non-equivalent equation. You know, it can't be 2A plus 2B equals 2, 4, 6, so that's just multiplying both sides by 2. You have to have a non-equivalent equation involving A and B. Even then, for this one, <clears throat> there are infinitely many solutions would be a better choice if it were available. So be afraid, be very afraid, do not choose, cannot be determined from the information given for any SAT math problem unless you know exactly why you cannot determine it from the information given. <clears throat> so, okay, basically it just appears to be an out for a kid who can't solve the problem. He's going to say, oh, I get it, it's a trick question. The smart kids know why, so now people will think I'm a smart kid. So then he goes, woohoo! Then later it's, don't! So, don't be a homer. All right, stress relief before and during the SAT. Don't stay up late studying, gaming, partying. Try to get to sleep at a normal hour. You don't want to be tired. Being tired makes you feel more stress and obviously less alert. Another thing that I don't have on here that's important is don't change your diet. It's not a great night to try a different kind of ethnic food for dinner that you've never had before. Um, and also in the morning, if you normally don't eat breakfast, that's not the day to pick the huge farm breakfast they always show on those sugary breakfast cereal commercials. You know, this cereal is great, a part of this healthy breakfast. You know, and of course, the breakfast itself would be great without the cereal. Anyway, just eat normally, sleep normally, just 
treat your body normally so you're well rested and you feel okay and you're not in any kind of weird state when you take it. Don't panic. Those of you who know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy probably recognize this picture. None of the problems are impossible, and even if one is impossible for you, it's only worth one point. It's worth the same as an easy question. If you spend more than about a minute on any particular question and you can't get anywhere with it, just pick your favorite letter and move on. Of course, if you can actually eliminate some obviously wrong answers, that's even better before you pick it. If all else fails, though, just guess. There is no guessing penalty on the SAT 1. There still are on the SAT 2 subject tests, but we don't care about that for right now. This is for the SAT 1. Murphy's Law. Nothing is as easy as it looks. Everything takes longer than you expect, and if anything can go wrong, it will at the worst possible moment. So just always assume that whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Obviously, we've all had lucky breaks plenty of times in our lives, but just plan as though it's always true and that you always have the worst luck. That way, you'll always either be prepared when things go wrong or pleasantly surprised when they don't. Check bomb door circuits one through four. Uh, bomb door circuits negative function. Lights red. Switch in backup circuit. Roger. Backup circuit switched in, still negative function. Engage emergency power. Roger. Uh, emergency power on, still negative function. Operate manual override. Roger. Uh, still negative function. Okay, so just assume that you have the worst luck. <clears throat> in other words, just like a problem where they ask, how many marbles will you have to pull from a jar to get at least three white marbles from a jar with eight blue marbles and five white ones, you have to assume that you have the worst luck. In the marble problem, you have to assume that you will pull all eight marbles, then pull three white ones for a total of 11, because that's how you can guarantee that you get at least three white marbles. Even if, say, you did it in the dark, so you don't know until you've pulled it out <clears throat> and taken it into the light. Test day Murphy's Law. Assume that your or your parents or guardian's car will break down. Be prepared to take public transit walk or Uber, Lyft, taxi to the site. Assume that the test proctors don't know you, especially if you're not taking it at your school. Bring your ticket and the best ID you have, such as a passport, driver's license, or at least school ID. So if somebody isn't convinced that you are you, you can show them ID. And you probably want to map it out on Google Maps to see how long it takes you to Uber, Lyft, Taxi, Walk, etc. to the site. All right, that's all I have for today. I wish you luck on the upcoming SAT or ACT or whatever test you may be taking. That again